I'd like to invite up our star of the day. She is not only our speaker, but also our song leader in song. Karen Drucker is a magnificent individual. She, as I said in first service, she really embodies the, all the enthusiasm of a 12-year-old girl. Look at the ringlets in her hair, the energy and enthusiasm. I like that I'll stay at 12. That's good. Mm -hmm. I like that. But she is a sage. She is a a deeply spiritual individual Mm -hmm. and uh, who does uh, women's retreats. Uh, she has all kinds of talents, including um, being a mermaid. She was a mermaid for a while. She was also some of the original <laughs> elevator music, actually playing a piano in an elevator uh, for uh, surprised guests. Well, I just have to explain that for a second. Okay. So someone hired me for a Christmas party at, this, at the San Francisco uh, law office. They, they had this great idea that if I just was playing... Christmas songs, when the elevator opened at the end of their long day, they would open the elevator and I'm going, joy to the world! And, they, and the elevator would open and people would go, ah! And they would just run the other way. So it didn't, it didn't work. So anyway, but that's what that was. Okay. Sorry, I just, you know, I have to explain these things. That's a, I mean, that's a, that would be quite a, quite a surprise. It was sort of a shock. Oh, quite a surprise. Okay. Karen has uh, created more than 19 uh, audio CDs, uh, music CDs that are available. And since Christmas is coming, they make uh, excellent uh, stocking stuffers. My new manager. There you go. Uh, uh, One-stop shopping here at Creative Living Fellowship. Um, You wrote a book. Wrote a book. And the book of the title is? Let Go of the Shore. Wow. Uh, Could you create a a message around that? I think I might. Just this Uh, morning. Just this morning? We are going to welcome Karen here in the typical Creative Living Fellowship way. We're going to rub our hands together and say after me, Karen, we welcome your wisdom. Karen, we welcome your wisdom. We honor your depth. We honor your depth. We are encouraged by your music. We are encouraged by your music. And we welcome you with open hearts. Take it away, wow. Karen. Thank you. I don't know why I'm starting with this, but I just found this this morning. In the not-too-distant future, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook will merge to form one giant, idiotic, supersized, time-wasting, non-productive, time-stealing, mind-numbing, do-not-need-to-know website called You Twit Face. <laughs> so, Good morning. Who lets their life be totally easy? There's plenty of people who are not raising your hands right now. Who makes it a struggle and efforts and struggles and things that have things you have to like... Because if you don't have this issue, I'll just go on to another talk. I could just do something totally different. So I don't know about you, but yes, I am a person who doesn't always... Well, first of all, you need to know something about me. Every song I write, every single song that I write, every chant... You get to see what all my issues are, because whatever I'm working on in my life is what I do songs about, what I write songs about, so that I can explore it and affirm it. I mean, people come up to me all the time and go, oh, you, you've just got this down. And it's like, no, no, no. The reason I write these songs is for me to remember. And so if anything today, I, I don't know if I'll, if I'll tell you anything new, but I feel like my job in this world is to remind us to remind myself and to remind you. And a lot of it comes down to this idea of just coming back to center, to remind, you know, I have a song called You Are the Face of God. Oh, I like it when people go, oh, I like that song. (laughs) So you are the face of God. This is what God is. And a lot of times when I sing, I find myself doing this because it's like it's bringing me back. And so if anything, this this talk today, and also just you coming to this church and having this community, these new members, we come here and we, we come to this community and we listen to this kind of music and we read these books to be remembered, to, just, to, just to remember that divinity, that place right here. You know, and a lot of times we kind of go off, you know, but it's, it's how we gently bring ourselves back. So my talk today is about letting it be easy, but also about letting go. You know, this is the time of year that we start to go inside a little bit more. We go a little bit more deeper down. And it's really a time of just like letting go of what hasn't worked in this year. What are we letting go of? Does, does anyone have an issue with letting go? 
Okay, good. I have some things to say about that. But one of the, one of the things I learned very uh, early on in my life was how uh, I learned about letting go and surrender and a lot of my main life lessons from being a swimmer. My father had this idea when I was very young that uh, if he put me on a swim team, if he taught me how to swim and I could be a competitive swimmer like he was, that I would learn all of life's messages in life. And I was just like, really? But this is what he thought. And so at six years old, I was stuck on a swim team in Southern California. And so this was my life. All I did was swim. And I, I grew up, and I was going to swim meets every, every single weekend, and I had this whole career. And by the time I got to high school, I was so done with all of this. I mean, yes, you know, I, I was, I mean, people were just, they always thought of me as a fish or a mermaid or, you know, a whale. That's a whole other story. But, you know, it's like I just had this, this, this persona of just like all I was was a swimmer. And I, and I wanted to be a typical teenager. I wanted to be named Buffy and Muffy and go to the mall with all my friends and go, oh my God, you guys, and just have that life. But instead, I was always in the pool. And so when I was about, oh, 16 years old, I, I stormed into my father and said, I am quitting swimming. I'm done with all this competition and, you know, always smelling like eau de chlorine. And it just was like, I was just done with it. And he listened to me rant and rave and he said, you don't know this yet, but you're going to learn all your life's lessons from being a swimmer. You know, and he gave me this whole philosophical thing. So, of course, you know, at that age, you're just going, whatever. Okay, fine. And so I stayed in swimming. Actually, I became captain of the boys' swim team, which was sort of interesting. All the boys would go down to the bottom of the pool with their goggles and look up at me swimming. It was very, you know, it was like... But I, I, I stayed in swimming all the way until through college, and then I was done. But when I was about 25, I was suffering from a broken heart from some breakup. And my sister said, you know, why don't you just go back in the water? It might make you feel better. It's like, I don't do swimming anymore. I don't want to do that. But I took her advice, and I just went to this one place that I, I knew had lap swimming. And I went in that water, and that was when I was just really starting on a spiritual path. And I remember getting in that water and feeling like God was holding me. You ever ha- have you ever felt that with water? You ever been in the ocean and you just like floated? And I just felt that feeling of like I was being held, that everything was going to be okay in my life because I was just being held in this safe place. And the side, there was also some really cute guys on the team, so I just stayed. But, <laughs> but I started swimming, and I started to join this, this team, and the, the, the turning point for me was I actually was asked to be part of a swim uh, race across Lake Tahoe, a cold water race. And I had never been in cold water, and someone said, well, you know, when you jump in, you're not going to be able to breathe for about five minutes, but don't worry. And, but I did this swim, and it was exhilarating, and I wanted more of it. And so I joined a team in San Francisco. There's a club at Aquatic Park at Ghirardelli Square, if, if, if any of you ever been down there. There are two clubs, the South End Rowing Club and the Dolphin Club. And I joined the Dolphin Club with the idea that I wanted to swim from Alcatraz. And this was my big goal, was to swim from Alcatraz. And I remember after I accomplished that goal, something really interesting happened. That after I accomplished that goal, the next day I got in the water and it felt 10 degrees colder. It was so cold. And I thought, well, that's what happens when you've accomplished a goal. That my mind, my intention was so big on doing that that the next day was like the goal was done. And it just all of a sudden it was like, ah, this is cold. But the one of the things that I learned so early on, one of my, you know, my dad was actually right about the lessons because one of the first things that I learned was the idea of getting in cold water, you have to let go. You have to lean in to something. How often do we, when we have something in our lives that's hard or scary, instead of leaning in, we resist, we pull back? Well, one of the things I learned about cold water swimming that's so fascinating is that when you first get in the water, you hit this wall. And most normal people will go, wow, this is cold. I don't think so. And you will retreat. But in this case, I know what's on the other side of that wall. So it's like a portal. And if you think of all the portals that you've been through in your life, when you get up to that portal, you have a choice. You always have a choice of what you're going to do. You either back off or you look at how can you make it through that wall. And in swimming in in the cold water, when you breathe and you actually, it sounds really wacky, 
But when you actually become one with that water, when you just go, yes, it's cold. Wow, my knees are going numb. You start to feel these things. All of a sudden you get, it's like it dissolves and you move into this nirvana state. Now, how often have you done that in your life where you've gone up against something really hard in your life, that there was this wall right in front of you and that there are times, you know, there are really times when you have to check in with your heart and say, am I ready to go through that? You know, I have a song, I will be gentle with myself. I will be gentle with myself. And I will hold myself like a newborn baby child. And the bridge to that song says, I will only go as fast as the slowest part of me feels safe to go. I will only go as fast as the slowest part of me feels safe to go. So you know, I truly believe we all know in our hearts when we're getting up to something that's in front of us when it's time to move through it and when there's time to move back. And one of the ways that I find that I check that place in me is I have an exercise I do every morning, and I start all my women's retreats this way, that you put your hand over your heart, and you say, what does my heart have to say? What does my heart have to say? And I got that line, that little sweet line, from um, a play that I was in. I was I was hired to be part of a little theater troupe years ago in the Bay Area where um, we had this little theater troupe that would go around to children's hospitals. And it was a little puppet show, and my character was called Dr. Hart. And I was filled with all these hearts, a big heart smock and heart shoes and heart earrings and heart everything. But my job in this play was I had a stethoscope, and I would go up to all the little kids, and I'd put my little stethoscope on their heart, and I'd go, what does your heart have to say? What does your heart have to say? And these little lammy poos would look up at me, and they're all, you know, they've got tubes and all these things, all these wires, and they'd look up at me, and it was like the first time that someone had given them permission. It wasn't their doctor or their parents. And they'd look up at me and go, well, my heart is kind of sad because I, I'm really sick, and I know my parents are really scared, and my heart kind of hurts because I just want to go out and play. And, you know, just doing that, just allowing yourself every day to just say, what does my heart have to say? You know, so there are times when it's actually appropriate to resist something. You're not ready yet. But sometimes if you really look in your heart, your heart's going to go, come on, you can do it. And you lean into that cold. So whatever you resist, persists. So if you, if you resist it, if I, get, if I go, oh, my God, it's so cold, it's so cold, it's so cold, it's going to be really cold. But the more I allow myself to just go, ah, and just deal with that cold for a minute, I get to this other side. And the beauty of this place is just amazing. I'll look out and I'll see the Golden Gate Bridge. And I'll see Alcatraz. And the fog is coming over Mount Tamalpais. And it's nirvana. It's just nirvana. But the other thing, one of the main lessons I learned from my father is the idea of really let it be easy. Struggle is not required. Have you ever noticed when someone doesn't know how to swim very well, what do they do? They're just flailing around. They're putting out lots of energy. Well, how much energy do you put in out in life when things that when you're just, when you're just, you know, needing to do with some task, but you just do all this extra energy? You know, I look at it very much like this. We have a limited amount of energy in our lives. <clears throat> and it's, if you look at your life force as a balloon, if someone came along with a tack and went like this, it would go, right? But what we tend to have is a lot of little pinpricks going, right? We have little pinpricks of, you know, sitting there doing too many emails or being with negative people or saying yes when you really want to say no or all those little things that just go tss. So it's allowing yourself to just check in with your heart in the morning and say, what does my heart have to say? Am I living the life that I want? Am I doing the things that I want on a daily basis? So when you think about letting life be easy, there is no struggle. Really, if you really just check in with your heart and just say, what is mine to do today? That no that you want to say to someone can actually be a lot easier than what we make it up to be. But we'll, go, we'll tell all these stories and we'll go all around. It'll be all this chaos. Hmm. So the other lesson I really learned from, from swimming is about being present. 
we, we learn that all the time, right? In, in this philosophy, we're always talking about being present and being mindful. Well, I would be part of uh, these different races that would happen in the bay. And I was always, I was one of the better swimmers. So I'd always be like within the top five or the top ten people coming in. And there was one guy on my team named George. And George, God bless his little heart, he would come up in front of me every single swim that we would do. And he just, and he was this little stocky guy and he'd come up and he'd go, I'm going to get you on this one, Drucker. And he'd just like <laughs> do this kind of thing to me. And, you know, I'd be like, no, you're not. And I would just do this little sparring. And we would, and it was amazing because you'd have 50 people starting off at a, a race, like a, underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And you're all kind of packed in, but within like two minutes, everyone's spread out. You know, the tides are taking everybody in different ways and you're spread out. But what would always happen is I'd be underneath the, about the middle of the span and I'm racing really hard. And who do I see right next to me? Just like this is George. And we would battle it out every single race. I'd win one. He'd win one. I'd win the next one. He'd win the next one. And we just had this thing going. Well, one day we're, you know, we're swimming along. And of course, here he is right next to me. And I look and all of a sudden he's not there. I'm thinking, did he drown? I'm going to win? No. Um, (laughs) But I look, and all of a sudden, I look back, and he's over here, and he's like doing this in the the water. He's like doing water ballet or something. And I swim back to him, and I go, George, what are you doing? We're in a race here. What's going on? And it was just one one of those pivotal moments in my life, because he says to me, Karen, How often are we underneath the Golden Gate Bridge with the fog coming in and this beauty and look at the pelicans and look at all of this stuff? How could we be putting our heads down in the water and not seeing any of it? And I went, you're right. And so from that moment on, I changed. In that moment, I joined him and we start doing water ballet and we're dancing in the water and we're having all this fun. Now, all of a sudden, all the people that were always behind us who wanted to always beat us, they start coming up and going, what are you guys doing? We're going, we're, we're living our lives. It's beautiful. And they're like, they're like, forget about you. And they just, you know, go and they, they win. But the thing that has changed for me is I've never, ever been in the top five again. I'm usually in the bottom five of the race because I want to be present I want to start every day. What does my heart have to say? My heart wants awe and wonder in my life. I want to be present to everything that's going on. The idea that I'd put my head down and not see this. So now I go out, I swim breaststroke, I look around, I'm waving to people, I have a great time. That's what I want to be. Actually, you know, the great story of swimming in the bay. I, I, I was so present one, one particular day, the day after 9-11. I remember I was swimming in the bay. I was about half a mile out, and all of a sudden, and I was like, the, and I, I also need to let you know, not only does the water hold me, but it also heals me whenever I'm going through anything in water. And, I, and you know, I'm not talking about any of this stuff today about that you have to be a good swimmer. I'm talking about that you could just float in water and just feel it. And it's my healer. It just cleanses me. It heals me. And so after 9-11, I had to be in the water. And I was just out there, and I'm swimming, and I'm crying. And all of a sudden, I got this complete download of a song. And it was a song called, I'll Light a Candle for America. And we will light the world with our love. It was a song all about 9-11. And I remember sprinting to shore and seeing a guy talking on his cell phone. And I come up and I go, excuse me, can I borrow your phone? And he goes, sure. And, he get, and, and I call my, my home number. I sing the song on my phone machine so I can remember it. I give him back his phone and go, thank you. And I go diving back into the water. And I saw him go, these people in San Francisco are really weird. <laughs> But, you know, you got to be present to it all, you know. But that's one of the things that I do every time in my life that I find myself, again, doing this, not being not being here, but going off when I'm when I'm walking in mere woods where I live. I'm in this beautiful area that I go walking in and my husband will go in there sometimes and we we're power walking. We're doing our hiking. We're power walking and we're hearing all these people that are just all these tourists with all of these different accents, taking pictures and going, look at these trees, and we're power walking. And all of a sudden, you know, we'll turn to each other and go, are you even here? Are you even here? And I'll go, no. And we'll just stop for a minute and just breathe. And we go through that other portal of just being present. We go, okay, now we can walk, and we are so much more present and seeing the beauty 
all around. One of the other lessons I learned is about trusting my intuition. Um, I, I usually swim all the way up until the temperature gets to about 53, and then I stop for the winter. But there was one year that I thought, okay, I am going to just challenge myself, and my birthday is on December 19th. And usually every year they have what is called the Alcatraz qualifier, where you have to qualify to do the Alcatraz swim from Alcatraz to San Francisco on New Year's Day. It's really cold on that day. But you have to qualify for it, meaning you have to swim in this little cove. You have to go two times around, which is about 40 minutes in the bay. Well, I knew on that particular day I was good for about 20 minutes. So I was going to make myself just do 20 minutes, and that was going to be the end of the season for me, and aren't I a good kid? And so this was on my birthday on December 19th, and I thought, that's my gift to myself. So I got in, I swam one time around, and I'm good until I walk out of the water, and there's someone standing on the dock looking, looking at all the swimmers, this guy who knew me, and he, and he, he yells out to me, Drucker, you're a wuss. He goes, you're such a wimp. You know, why you can't even do two times around. You're a wimp. And I'm like, I am not a wimp. And what do I do? I go back in the water to prove to this guy that I'm not a wimp. And I go back around and halfway around, all of a sudden, this is how hypothermia looks, that all of the core heat goes right to here. So it means that all of these become like really, bleh. and so now I'm swimming and I have like these rubber arms. And I look back to where I'm headed, you know, where I'm supposed to go back to the the club, and it looks like a Fellini movie, that it's like just kind of doing this wishy-wishy thing. And somehow, by the grace of God, I wound up going all the way in. But by the time I got in, I was so, this is not a good thing. By the time I got in, I was a little spaced, and I knew how spaced I was, that I looked at my watch, and it said 9.43. Now, I was born at 9.43 on December 19th. And I went up to all of these people with my face completely frozen and going, in my birthday, in my birthday, in my birthday. And they were going, okay, she's not well. And they, you know, they guide me up to the sauna and I'm like, my whole body is like bricks, you know, just like a brick of ice. But it just showed me that I did that because one person thought I couldn't do it. And so the biggest thing I've learned in my life is trusting my heart, trusting my intuition, trusting when I know when something is right or wrong for me. I will only go as fast as the slowest part of me feels safe to go. You're the only one who knows. And there's some times when you want to back away, but life is calling you forward. The spirit is calling you forward. That spirit has a higher vision of what it is that you're supposed to do. You know, and the last story I want to tell you about is that um, I was part of a English, uh, I was part of a relay team that swam the English Channel. So we were actually the first American women to swim the English Channel as a relay. There were six of us. You swim an hour each. Yeah, it's kind of fun, kind of kind of wacky, but um, that's what I do for fun. And but this was back in 1989. And when we called up and said we wanted to do this, they said, well, if you can complete it, you'll you'll hold the record as the first American woman to do this. And so, you know, this was like, okay, game on. But what was really interesting is that when we really researched this, we found that it's 22 miles straight across. But if you go straight across, you're not going to make it. You have to go in a zigzag, which is actually 32 miles. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at goals that I have in my life and whatever, I look at this and I go, oh, I just want to go there. And it's going to be just this straight line. And the other lesson I've learned is life doesn't always go in straight lines, does it? that we have to allow ourselves to let it curve and zigzag. And in this particular example, this was an example of like the first woman jumped in and she swam like this, but I was number two and I got to go over here. I was swimming to New York and the entire time I'm going, why am I going this way when this is where I want to go? And my little brain, my little inner critic, everything that's making judgments and knows what's best for everybody at all times is just going wacky, going, why am I swimming this way? But the more I let go and trusted that the pilot on that boat had a compass and a radar and he can see things that I can't and he's actually a representative of God, of that higher power, that inner knowing that we all have that can go up above our circumstance and have a better idea and understanding of what's going on in our lives. 
And so I went this way, the other gal went this way, we went a zigzag of 32 miles and wound up in Calais, France in 10 hours and 54 minutes. But what's really also interesting about this story and why I always love to say, tell it, is that when you have any of the tanker ships that are going through the channel, you have to actually sign a waiver with the English Channel Commission that says, yes, I know I'm a really dumb swimmer that is swimming the English Channel, and if a tanker ship comes, they can't stop, and I'm now signing my name here saying, yes, if the tanker ship comes and they run me over, I was at fault. Here you go. There you go. Because what happens is the tanker ships, if they want to make a slight right-hand turn, it takes them seven miles to do that. They have to know seven miles out that they're going to turn. And why I love this idea is that when I look at all the changes I've made in my life, all the turns I've made, they were never jagged. They were never these fast things. They were always these slow, wow, I see where I want to go, and I start to move my life over that way. And then I'll stay there for a while, and I'll go, what does my heart have to say? Oh, wow, it's moving me over this way. And then I'll stay there for a while, and then something will happen where I'll get upset and angry, and I'll start to realize, wow, Spirit is calling me to do something different because this doesn't feel good anymore. And I'll move that way. You know, when I left my job as a music director of a church, I was a music director of a church for 15 years, and I remember when the minister did this whole incredible ritual with me of having sheet music. She made a big circle of sheet music around my piano. And I remember I, had, I came in the middle of the circle and I was playing a song. And then the new music director came in and they took over the song. And then I was standing here and I rem- I'll never forget her holding her hand out to me and saying, are you ready to move on to your next self-expression? Whatever that's going to be. And the congregation, they had to do a ceremony with me. Do you allow her to go to whatever her next self-expression is? And they, yes, we do. And I was like, really, you do? Okay, it's all right. And, <laughs> but then when she said to me, are you ready? And I, I'll never forget stepping over just, it's just a little, you know, this much. But I felt like I was walking over the Grand Canyon. That that idea of stepping from what I knew was safe and secure and moving into something that I didn't even know what it was going to look like. I had no clue, but I had said yes because Spirit had kept planting that seed in me of this and this and this, and now it was time for that next step. So what are you needing to let go of to go to that next step in you? Because you can't, you can't stay there and go here. You know, I look at one of the guys on my, uh, at my, my uh, club, at the Dolphin Club, and he's an old man, and he, he, he just has it rigged up in his mind that if he gets in that water every day, he's going to stay alive, and he must be like 95. And what he does, you talk about letting go, he walks down here to the, end, ed of, uh, the edge of the, the bay where we just have like a little inlet, and he'll just walk out, and he'll just get in the water, and he just lets it float him back to shore. Just float him back to shore. He just lets go and just floats. How much can we let go and float? You know, when I even think about the people, like how people even get into the water and how that's a choice. You know, a lot of people do this. They go back and forth and they look at the water like if they just keep doing this, it's going to raise a couple more degrees and they can get in. And there's one woman who just goes into her ankles and then her knees and then her thighs and it takes her 45 minutes to get in the water. You know, that's you. And then, then there's me. And then there's me that I just, you know, I scream like a sailor. I I swear I do all these things, but I get in. You know, and it's the same thing. When you let go, how do you do it? Do you just keep doing this and saying, I know I have to let go, you know, or do you just, do you do little teeny bits like that? What is your style in doing it? You know, are you ready to just jump in and do whatever it is that God is calling you to do? What your next expression is? Who knows? What does my heart have to say? But the last thing I want to leave you with is that, I know you're talking about community a lot this, this, um, this month, and especially with today with welcoming new members. And, you know, the full circle of this story of swimming is that when my dad was about to pass away from dealing with cancer, I was with him at the very end. And I, I, I was with him one day, and, you know, he just was, like, uncomfortable. And, you know, we didn't know how much longer he had. And I, 
I said, Dad, you want to go swimming? And he looked at me and said, really? I could do that? I said, yeah, why don't we try? And I remember walking him to the car, getting him in the car, getting him to this little swim club, and putting him in the water. And, he, you know, now he's in the water. It's just this healing, nurturing place that was holding him. And we swam, you know, we just swam down the length of the pool, and we stopped, and he just turned to me and said, thank you so much. And we pushed off. I remember my goggles filled with water. And it was just one of the most beautiful, completing moments. And he died the next day. But how amazing that he was able, I really feel like he was able to let go and surrender because he felt that being held. And that's really what a lot of this is, is surrendering. Letting go, surrendering. Knowing you have a choice, but surrendering. I will surrender to my greatest highest good I will release any fears that block my way for every step I take is taken in pure faith and I am stronger every moment every day my mind is willing and my heart is open wide I trust my instincts and let spirit be my guide. I vow to live a life that's real and pure and free as I continue walking in this mystery. I will surrender to my greatest, highest good. I will release any fear that blocks my way. For every step I take is taken in pure faith. And I'm more loving every moment, every day. Now there may be walls and there may be roadblocks in my way. But I can choose. I'll say that line again because it's kind of important. I can choose. Actually, that's what my whole talk was about. I can choose to take a higher path each day. And now I know that what I thought was safe and sound was only habit and regret that held me down. I will surrender to my greatest, highest good. I will surrender to my greatest, highest. I will release any fear that blocks my way. I will release any fear that blocks my way. For every step I take is taken in pure faith. For every step I take is taken in pure faith. And I'm more loving every moment, every day. And I'm more loving every moment, every day. And I'm kinder every moment. And I am kinder every moment, every... I will surrender. I will surrender every moment, every... So as my new mentor, Dory, from the new movie Finding Dory says, just keep swimming. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.